Uh, good morning. Uh, welcome to the second day of this uh, European MAM. Uh, today we'll introduce a very interesting concept. It's a new feature, actually, that uh, came. Uh, it's from started from 6.35. It's been introduced to MicroDIC. Um, it's actually a simple feature, but with very interesting uh, results. Um, so we talk about the HTTP network packet scheduler, uh, and uh, we will do some live experiment as well. <coughs> Let's uh, introduce ourselves. Uh, many of you uh, already know me. Many of you, I see many people that I've trained. Uh, I'm a Microsoft, Microsoft certified trainer, uh, been a certified consultant for marketing and other brands as well. Uh, specialized in ISP. Uh, we spend corporate networks development uh, and been working with Microtech uh, since 2006. Uh, I'm active member of RIPE and administrator for several uh, autonomous systems. Uh, I also hold a master's degree of uh, electronic engineering and blah, blah, blah. Uh, about uh, my colleague, uh, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me speak for himself. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, sorry. So, um, uh, as well as Alfredo, together we, we are both trainers. We usually try and do training together. Um, uh, certifications, we're certified in uh, pretty much all, all the courses covered by Microtic at this point, as well as IPv6. Um, certified um, consultant as well for Cisco with CCNA and CCNP, as well as a background in administration, uh, Microsoft mostly. I have a background in uh, service provisioning, uh, betting industry mostly, for providing robust and highly available infrastructures, which is what they are looking for in, in many cases. Um, over 15 years experience uh, with the Microtic product and, and Router OS to provide uh, such robust services. So uh, it looks like we are getting very, very well uh, together. So we started, we decided to start a company, actually. The guy is a genius. So uh, <laughs> we started in 2014, we're providing IT training and consultancy under the name of TickTrain. But then we incorporated in 2015 as a company in, uh, in Ireland. So started operation in Europe, the most requested services that we work on, uh, mission critical networking consulting, uh, to full ISP design and redesign, uh, network training as well. Uh, mostly, most operation areas concentrated of course in Europe uh, with uh, Ireland, Malta, uh, Italy, the Netherlands, and of course Spain. But we also have uh, started to have clients in uh, Latin America, especially on the Pacific coast. So what's the idea behind the Titania networks? Uh, the idea is to actually to concentrate in a single point of contact many uh, requirements that nowadays networking and IT, so uh, bringing the hyperconvergence to a single point of contact. So we we actually partner with many, many people. We don't seek clients, we seek partners because every single customer is for us a partner. We try to uh, spread the um, networking, with not only networking in the, in the IT meaning, but also networking in the partnership meaning. So we concentrate connectivity, uh, design, global partner network and consulting and infrastructure. So we partner with a customer that do have infrastructure and making their infrastructure work for other customer or our own network. Okay. Everything with providing a single point of traffic uh, or contact because we try, we believe that everybody should receive the, the, the right support. So we try to maintain the support in Italian, Spanish and uh, Maltese of course. A uh, little bit of uh, some of our customers, uh, as I told you, mostly Europe. Uh, we have um, uh, some in Ireland, uh, Italy, Malta, uh, and something in Latin America, especially focusing on Mexico. So, uh, finished the introduction, let's go uh, to the presentation. Uh, with this presentation, we try to seek, we try to explain the concept that are involved with HTV and uh, the new feature that have been introduced, what we can achieve with this new feature, and trying to get an holistic picture 
from the available documentation, because there is a very nice documentation on this. Uh, the week is very, very interested, but um, maybe lacks a little bit of practical application, so we tried to actually see what you can do with this new feature. Let's go, let's go start with concepts. So first we have to, uh, if you're used to, if you've seen uh, any other of, my, of our presentation, we try to get to the root of the problem. So we try to get to understand why things work some way. So in this case, we have to go down to the Linux kernel uh, to actually understand why it is behaving in some way. So we'll talk a little bit about the Linux kernel, the queuing, queue type, queue kind, queue size, uh, the HTB algorithm itself, the token buckets, the classes, and we try to put everything together with some configuration basics and real-time lab demonstration. What are the concepts that are involved in this uh, scenario? So first of all, we have to talk about shaping, scheduling, and queues. So what, what is a queue? What is a queue of, of packets? A queue happens when the packets are for some reason buffered or delayed for some reason. Now we can decide to let out packet at a certain rate. Now we're talking about uh, shaping. Or we can decide to let the packet the the slow down some packets and because so there is enough bandwidth for other packet to pass. And now we're talking about scheduling. Everything that is happens into the queue. So you basically, all of us use queuing. So who's, uh, who's using queuing is in its own network? Nobody? Huh? Okay. So, What's the truth about Q and what's the truth about QoS itself? Okay. First, queues are located between the system and the interface. And they determine how data is sent from the interface itself. So there is no way you can actually limit how the data is received. So there is no communication between the interfaces on the, of, the other, of the other end. So you cannot tell the other guy, hey, send me packets lower. So if you are a router and you control both interfaces, you can actually shape in the outgoing interface. But there is no way that you can actually tell the other router, hey, send me packets lower. Okay, so you can control how that is sent out on the interface. And we will make actually a proof of this. Okay, Q can be used to buffer the excess of output bandwidth to prevent packet loss in case of burst traffic. So in case there is a traffic that acts like a very high burst, you can buffer that traffic so the hard, because the hardware can take that much traffic. So you buffer it. So you send it little by little. And that is generally a good thing. Generally speaking, that is a good thing. Now, TCP, because the way it works, it will try to, f to fill any queue you offer to it. Have you ever tried the bandwidth test? The bandwidth test tool on the microtech. So what's the difference when you try it with UDP and what's the difference when you try with TCP? When you try with TCP, it will start as high as you can go, right? When you try with UDP, it will ramp up. Isn't that way? Yeah, and that's the reason. That's the way TCP works. Actually, that's the reason why queuing works better on TCP as well, because TCP will downregulate itself. Okay, so queues will create artificial latency, and that affects interactivity. For example, when your K stroke must traverse a long queue, try to put a long, very high, very long size queue on an SSH session. So you hit the case stroke, and then it will take so long to actually be received from the other end. Okay, and that is generally bad. Okay, so let's try, let's try to understand why we cannot send, we cannot actually shape what is sent to us. So shall we try the lab? So a little, very small lab. Uh, 
Thank you very much. We go to. Hmm? Are we going to? Yeah. So what do we have here? What? So what we have here at the moment is we have uh, two small microtics. One is configured as a source. The other one is configured as a target. We're going to do some lab uh, during our presentation to show the, what, what's happening. And in our case, we're not going to use the bandwidth test tool, in this case, as the phrase says, but we're going to use the traffic generator where we have uh, predefined uh, a packet over there to be sent basically between the two devices on Ethernet 4. So these are con connected back to back on Ether 4, Ether 4 to Ether 4. And what we're going to do, we're just going to send traffic in one direction to saturate the link. Okay. So if I don't have a queue and I start the traffic generator, I can set the speed here. Let's say we set it to 15 megabits. Okay. I'm going to see okay, that over here, one second. It's trying to saturate the link. Okay, the, the amount of traffic is coming. It's not refreshing as, as accurate, but there is 15 megabits of constant traffic going through. Okay, now what I'm going to do, I'm going to create a simple queue. Okay, on the other side, let me lower it down to 10. Okay. So what's happening is that on the receiver side, even though the simple queue is showing up as red, meaning that it is completely saturated, uh, it's trying to limit the traffic to five megabits. It's trying to do something. Unfortunately, on the interface, on the receiver end, I'm still receiving the total traffic being sent by the source. This is exactly to explain that the way QoS works, it has to be stopped when it's leaving an interface. So if I'm on the other end, if the data is already sent to me from the source, there is nothing I can do for me to block the traffic. So even though the queue is trying to block it, this UDP traffic is coming, is hitting me on the interface, it's still coming at the maximum speed that is being sent. If it's being sent at 10 megabits, I will be receiving it at 10 megabits, and the queue can do nothing about it. Actually, we can see it over here in the traffic graph. Okay, so we'll start. Okay. okay. So basically, there is nothing you can do to limit what you are receiving. Okay, you can limit what you are sending out. Okay, so basically, <coughs> this is the this is the what actually the queue is capturing. Okay, the queue is trying to capture five megabits. That five megabits actually doesn't limit the speed of the interface. Okay, so let's try to go back and let's try to understand why things work this way. So let's go back to the Linux kernel. So when Matthew said to me, let's do, a, let's do a presentation about the HTB. I said, oh, HTB, I remember this thing. HTB, HTB. And actually, oh my God, I, was, I used to be a contributor when this, all these things started. But look at that. That was actually 15 years ago. I'm getting old. <laughs> Okay, so before HTB was not even compiled in the kernel. We have to, you had to compile it as a separate package. Okay, now of course now everything is integrated and so let's go to the Linux kernel. So the, what happens when a packet travels to a queue? Basically the forwarding stack of the local process sends data out to the kernel the kernel will enqueue data to the queue type selected. The queue type, we, you know, we have that tab where you select the queue type. Okay, that's the, that's the algorithm you select. Uh, and for the queue, and immediately tries to run the queue to the hardware using the function queue run. Okay? So what is actually defining the queue type? will define the way the algorithm will actually send out packets. You know we have several queue types. We have P54, we have SFQ, we have RED. So that's actually the way the queue run will 
lend, will let out packets. Now, the, fun the function q run itself will call the function dq according to the q kind algorithm to send out the hardware provided that the hardware can take as much. So let's see how the q works in several queuing strategies. The very, very simple q, p5. So packet 5, it's a 5, first in, first out. The first packet that comes in goes out from the queue. So basically we are acting as a buffer. It's, it can be like bytes or packets. We can actually count bytes or packets. The first packet that comes in, as you can actually see here, the first packet that comes in, the first of his caller, will come out on the other end. So the DQ will actually, every DQ, every call of the DQ will DQ a packet to the hardware. So this arrow here means the packet is sent from the queue to the hardware. Okay? Very simple. Let's complicate our life a little bit. SFQ. So SFQ is a first attempt to distribute the opportunity to transmit fairly between several sub queues. How do we know which sub queues are there? We hash the source and the destination. Okay, so we, we, have, we use a hash function. Actually, we have, because a hash function might not be fair enough, we have a perturb parameter that we can set to say how much the hash function has to be perturbed. And so the queue. The, this time the queue will not run as in the FIFO. So take a look, this is the FIFO, this is the queue here. The DQ will run on the round robin algorithm. So each P5, each FIFO will actually have a dequeued packet in turn. So these packets are in standby. This is this is the queued, then this one is the queued, then this one is the queued, then the next one is the queued. Okay, this is the way SFQ works. What is the drawback of the SFQ? If every user would behave exactly the same, the SFQ will be fantastic. It will work perfectly. The problem is when one of the customer makes 1,000 connections and the other one makes one. The, the one customer with 1,000 connections gets 1,000 turns. So it will dequeue 1,000 times and the other one will just dequeue one time. So that's the issue with the SFQ. But then, something more, more interesting we have, generally speaking, we, to limit the amount of rate, this is actually talking about scheduling the packets. So we, this time we are scheduling the packet, making them pass one at a time. But what about having the packet pass at a certain specific rate? Do that in the past. There was an attempt which was called actually CBQ. It was so complicated. You had to calculate the average of the packet depending on the packet size and the timer milliticks of the of the kernel. It was very you know it was a very complex system because it's so complex to shape based on what is actually passing in the interface. So what what is the solution? The solution is to use some artificial algorithm. We use the tokens. To control the rate of dequeuing, counting the packet bytes dequeued is a complex and is timers depending. Instead, calculating the current usage, uh, instead of calculating the current usage, one method used widely in traffic control is to generate tokens at a decided rate and only dequeue packets or bytes if a token is available. Basically, we are generating something that says we give you a ticket. If you have a ticket, you can go. If there are no tickets, you wait. And here it comes the simple token bucket filter. We have the same queue as before. See? It's actually a FIFO. But now the, the queue function of the kernel will work slightly different. So we have a parallel process that injects token. Token means nothing. Don't, token is a virtual ticket. Okay? We are generating token at a constant rate. We can generate something constantly because we have the kernel timers that will run 
by itself on the clock itself. So we're generating token and we can generate token at the rate we want, basically. So we generate token. There is a decision here that says, uh, are token available? Yes. Packet is dequeued. Are token available? No. Then we wait until there are tokens. What's the result of this? Packets are only transmitted if there are sufficient tokens available. Otherwise, packets are deferred. We are introducing an artificial latency on the link. That's the, that's the reason, that's the function of the token bucket filter. Okay. But until now, we, are talk, we just talked about tokens. What about the bucket? Okay. So, in case that the queue does not need tokens immediately, what happens to those tokens? They are actually collected until they are needed. So we have some reserve, some, some, some uh, uh, place, some bucket, where we store all the tokens that are sent, that are generated, if in case they are not used. Okay, that's called the bucket. Now, the, num the number of unused tokens that can be stored depends on the size of the bucket. The larger the bucket, more tokens we can store. Of course, it doesn't make sense to store tokens forever. Because otherwise, the, the throughput will tend to, to, to the infinite when we start. Okay? So we store tokens up to the, tokens, token, up to the bucket limit. And actually, you can see it here. So, the, the token bucket actually acts as a reserve of tokens that are used in case the bandwidth, in case the packets are not using it. Uh, a queue that has, that has token available can initially dequeue a larger number of packets or bytes before tokens are depleted. Why? There are no, so no packets is being sent. Tokens are still coming because they, they, come, they still come at a constant rate. So we fill the bucket. If buckets start coming, when they do start coming, we have the bucket full. So we start every DQ, every call of the DQ function will succeed. We'll actually DQ a bucket. So it will DQ packets as fast as it can until the bucket is empty. And this looks like complicated. It is not. Now, this is a little bit complicated. To, uh, to further increase the, actually the, the, mm, the flexibility of the algorithm, we can actually use classes as well. Now, a part of the tokens that the class has by itself, generates, genera generated for the class itself, in a hierarchical structure, because HTB now we know it's hierarchical token bucket. Okay, it's like the token bucket we saw before, but we work in hierarchy. So, in this case, we can use the tokens that are generated for us, provided that we are the leaf, but then we can also borrow tokens from the parent class. Okay? When we work in, in tree structures, so when we work in, in, with child and parent, we have to uh, understand another truth about queues. Uh, HTB will not, never, never, never delay packets at the inner level. HTB will only delay packets at leaf level. The parent are only responsible of bo uh, actually lending tokens to the child. So the, the parents can only set the maximum rate of all the child for tokens to be received. That's what the parent do. They don't limit traffic. They just set the maximum rate of the token. The traffic limiting is always happening at the child. So let's try to 
uh, this is the last, this, well, one, two more. This is the last theory, okay, I promise, okay. This is the last, uh, the last part where we have to make a, 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 an abstraction effort. But it really makes us understand what happens to the various cases where we are actually seeing a packet that fits the queue. So, the children classes borrow tokens at their parents once they have exceeded limit at. What's the limit at? It's a different name, classic QS theory is the same name around CIR, committed information rate, is the amount of bandwidth that that class will receive no matter what. Okay. Now a child class will continue to attempt to borrow until it reaches max limit. Max limit is the maximum information rate. So it's the a maximum amount that, the, that they actually the class can go. It will then begin, begin to queue packets for transmission until more tokens are available. Okay, so the mechanism will happen exactly the same as it happened in, with the token bucket filter, but this time we can also borrow from the parent up to the max limit. So what are the conditions here? In, in, a, child, in a child class, if, we are, if our rate is below limited, okay, then, we, then the queue will happen based on all available tokens. So all the tokens that we have, the, because we are before limited, we know that the tokens are generated at least at limited. So every call of the, the queue will succeed, basically. If we are between limited and max limit, then the, the queue will try to borrow tokens from parent, if available. If we reach or the max limit or try to overcome the max limit, then the packet will be delayed because there will be no token that we can actually borrow from the parent. So the, the queue will still happen at that rate and that's it. That, that rate is the max limit because it's the maximum amount of token that we can borrow from the parent. That's it. At, at parent level, things are almost the same, slightly different. So if we are below limited, we lend to the children. If we are between limited and max limit, we try to borrow from the parent. If we, if we as a parent, we have an, a parent ourselves, okay? Uh, and if any, we lend to children. And if we are over max limit, we no borrow and no lend. Okay? So this is a lot of words to actually explain a mechanism that you really know very well. So the parent queue are responsible of distributing the traffic. The leaf queue are actually responsible of shaping every single flow. Okay? But now, the burst. Okay? Actually, if, if, we have under, if we actually we understood this, feature, the burst comes really, really easy to understand. The burst, you know, the burst, burst is a different beast, no? Because we, every time we start to burst, yeah, there is a calculation, the moving average and everything. Okay, burst, it's very easy to understand if we remember the token generation stuff. So, what happens with the burst? Burst feature, feature uh, it's a feature that allow, allow to satisfy Q requirement for additional bandwidth, even if the required rate is bigger than max limit for a limited period of time. Burst can occur if average rate of the Q is, uh, for the last burst time, seconds is smaller than the burst threshold, and that's the wiki definition. Burst mechanism is simple. If burst is allowed, Q will receive tokens at burst limit, not at max limit. That's why the, the, the Q can actually send more traffic than the, tra the, the, than the max limit, because the burst is actually making the, key, the token generation work at burst limit, not at max limit. Okay? Uh, when burst is disall disallowed, then the Q will receive token at max limit rate. So, Putting everything together. 
At the end of the day, the amount of readily available tokens in the child class will define its behavior. We can set how fast the, the token replenish with the max limit or with bus limit. Until Router OS version 6.35, bucket size was hair coded to one tenth of the max limit. But now this will default. Uh, that's why the now by default is set to 0 0.1. Okay, but now it will accept any values from 0 to 10. So we can actually change the bucket size, and we will now demonstrate what are the implications of changing the bucket size. Okay, so again, again the the wrap up. So the new HTB diagram. Many of you probably have seen this slide this on the wiki. So here we have three parts of the diagram. The first part of the presentation was actually working in explaining the first part, okay, the blue part. So packets are coming in, okay. If the queue is full, we drop the packet directly. Okay, so that's the part that defines the queue size. So if, the queue, if the queue is not is not full, we queue the packet. Then are token available? So this is the token inject. This, this is the token generation injection mechanism. The red part. We are injecting the tokens to the system. If tokens are available, then the packet is sent to the hardware. This is the hardware. If tokens are not available, then packet is queued. Okay. Now, at this point. In the black part, we are actually understanding how tokens are generated. So this is the actual token engine. So first of all, we have the, the, that the tokens are generated at limited, okay? Because remember, the limited is going to be uh, actually. It's the, the queue is going to observe limited no matter what. So you see this part here, extra tokens. You know why the extra tokens are needed? Because if limited is larger than parent max limit, it will actually break the system. It will actually make the child queue to go over the max limit of the parent, even if there are no tokens available. Because limited is the condition to be observed no matter what, is the CIR, is the committed information rate. So if no tokens are available at the parent, an extra token generation uh, facility is needed to create the tokens needed to observe the limited. So to respect the limited, we need extra tokens even if they are not, not available at the parent. That's why limited is the most important parameter of a queue. Then we have the burst. If burst is allowed, then token is generated at the burst limit. If burst is not allowed, then token is generated at the max limit. And this is the part that we are interested in. That's the bucket size. So the bucket size is how, may, how, many, uh, so how many tokens we can store, we can accumulate in the bucket and what will be the difference between having a large bucket and a small bucket? So what do you think will happen when we have the back, when the bucket is full? When the bucket is full of tokens and we start transmit packet, what do you think will happen? Come on. We can dequeue as, ma as many packets as the amount of tokens that are available, okay? So basically, uh, has it ever happened to you that you, you set a queue and you see, you do the, the test to actually see this queue in operation. Has you, have you ever seen that actually at the very beginning of the queue, it will go slightly upper than the, than the limit? And you know why is that? Because of the bucket. Exactly. Even if it was hard coded, then tenth part of it was actually uh, allowing the higher amount of traffic for a short period of time. But now we want, we would like to know how much traffic will pass 
are restricted. Okay, so how much traffic will pass are restricted. Yeah. And this is calculated with this math. So, so basically what we are saying here is that uh, we usually work with just the max limit and the limit at in general, and that is what we used to do in, in the previous versions when uh, the bucket size wasn't adjustable, okay? We couldn't adjust the bucket size. So, like Alfredo has been explaining the theory part of it, um, what is happening is that usually we hit the limit straight away on the, on the max limit, okay? So the max limit is our limit. Why? Because before we used the bucket size, okay, there were no tokens available, okay, to the queue, faster. So our limit was at what the maximum we set it to. Okay? Now, if we define a bigger bucket size, okay, it means there are more tokens available for a period of time okay, which will allow us to exceed our max limit. Okay? So that is what we are basically saying. And the formula to basically calculate this is that the bucket capacity is equal to the bucket size okay, times the max limit we set, okay? So let's take an example, okay? So if we set, okay, using the default, which is what we have in Mikrotic at the moment as a default value, which is the same as what we had in the previous version before uh, 6.35, is a value of 0 0.1. So if we take 0 0.1, multiply it by a max limit of 10, for example, what we get as a result is one megabit, okay? But the one megabit is not bandwidth. We're not talking about one megabit of bandwidth here, okay? Uh, but we're talking about one megabit of data which can flow through at the maximum speed possible. So when we start a bandwidth test, okay, what happens is that one megabit of traffic will try to burst even more than the 10 megabit limit which we have set. Obviously, one megabit is consumed very quickly. Because the one megabit is consumed very quickly, okay, what we see, we see a very tiny spike, really small spike, okay? So we have here um, uh, one of the slides, okay? So what we have over here, okay, is that we usually see a small spike over there. Why? Because when we started a bandwidth test, which tried to go at uh, maximum speed possible, one megabit of that traffic try to go even faster than our max limit of 10. And this is calculated at the previous formula, okay, which by default was 0.1. Okay? And 0.1 is pretty much relevant to 10% 10, um, of what we set as a max limit. So let's say I have a 50 megabit max limit Okay, with using always a default setting, using previous versions of Mikrotic OS, I start a bandwidth test. I expect to see at least that I get a spike which reaches 10% more than my max limit. So I should see a spike up to 55 megabits for a split of a second, and then it goes back to 50, which is my max limit. And this is why we see that in many bandwidth tests we did when we used to run bandwidth tests to test our queues, and really we didn't understand why we had this initial spike at the very beginning, okay? Now, we have the advantage with the bucket site to actually tune, tune that spike to something larger by making a bigger bucket size. Why? Because if we make a bigger bucket size, it means we have more tokens available for the, the bandwidth going through to be able to pass a faster throughput for a certain period of time, okay? So, what we can do, we can actually try and show, it, show this in a lab. And this time we're not going to use the, um, uh, the traffic generator, okay, but we're going to use the bandit test, okay? So we're not going to disable this and we're going for a small bucket size. By small bucket size, what we mean is that over here where we have the feature called bucket size now, available since um, uh, later than 6.35 um, is available, the default is 0 0.1, okay? So what we're going to see now in our bandwidth test as a terminal
Instead, we have the queue over here enabled, and we're going to have a look at the, at the traffic. So what we are seeing here, obviously because of, of TCP windowing, it will take a bit of a, some time to settle down. Okay. If we can see it over here. We are sending constant 10 megabits. Here we're getting it at, uh, yeah, we have some problem, I think. With the, Yes, thank you, Vanek. Sorry? The target? The target, yes. No, wait, it's wrong. I don't know. Would you want to be a Mac on the other? No, it's fine. Sorry about this. Basically, what we're getting here is a bit uh, that the, the sender is sending at a different burst. So we're seeing. It's probably just graphing. Yes, probably just graphing. So actually here, we can see it better. Let's see it here. Okay. So on the traffic, we can see it better. Okay. Actually, I want to do it TCP again. So, yeah. Over here, we can see it clearer here. We had, a, we had the bandwidth going up, okay? It looks much better here. We have, now we're using a receive. Like we explained before, the send cannot be controlled, okay? So what we're using in our bandwidth test is that we're asking the sender where, where we're doing the QS, asking the target to send us data. Since he is generating the data, leaving his interface, we can queue it, okay? So over here, we set a small bucket size, okay? A default bucket size with a max limit of 10. What we're seeing here, we're seeing that tiny spike, okay? Which is explaining exactly this, which is the 10% of the 10 megabit, okay, gives us a one megabit, which is allowed to go through at maximum speed for a certain period of time. And that is the default functionality which we have. But now we have the option of fine tuning and working further on that, okay? So what we can do, okay, is we can say, um, uh, let's work with a bigger bucket size and see what happens. Like we said, now we can go from either zero to 10, so what should we expect, okay, if we change the bucket size to 10? Okay. If we change the bucket size to 10, now with the formula is going to change to 10 times 10. 10 is the bucket size. 10 is our maximum limit. So we have 100 megabits, but this is again not 100 megabits of throughput immediately, but it's the amount of data, okay? So we expect to see a large amount of data trying to go through as quickly as possible, okay, until the tokens are used, and then we have to go back to our maximum limit, okay? So let's see this working in place, okay? Okay. So now we're going to stop our test, we're going to disable the small one, and we're going to enable the large bucket. And over here, again, we have 10 megabits of max limit with the difference that the bucket size is the maximum allowed by the function now, which is 10, okay? So what's going to happen now is that as soon... That's the other kit. Hmm? I'm scared. This is the right kit? Yeah, the large bucket with 10. So as soon as I... Oops. So as soon as I run the test now, you will see that even though I have a max limit of 10 megabits, 
Okay? As soon as I start the test, I'm going to get a period of time okay, where the throughput is exceeding the 10 megabits. Why? Because I have more tokens available, which I'm consuming at a faster rate. So in the part where I can see the graph going upwards, over there I've consumed 100 megabits of traffic, okay, faster than I should have, okay, because there were tokens available. Once I consumed the tokens, I went back straight away to my max limit, which is set to 10. So yeah, in this case, we are seeing that the, tra the traffic is growing gradually because we've changed our test to UDP. Okay? If we change our test to TCP, the moment there is no throughput over there, We can see that immediately, because TCP tries to consume all the throughput, okay, we've seen the traffic hitting peaks of around 40 megabits for a period of time. So basically it went 40 megabits, 40 megabits like about um, uh, trying to reach the 100. So basically try to consume 100 megabits of data okay, in the shortest time possible according to what I have available as an interface. In my case here I have um, 100 megabits interfaces, so the, fast, the fastest it could have reached would have been 100, which would have consumed it in a second. Okay? Until it got there, we have slightly more than a second over there, and it consumed the 100 megabit of data, and then it went down back to the maximum limit, which is set to 10 megabits. Okay. Is there any, are there any questions so far on what we've explained and what we've demonstrated? Okay. So, and that is what, what we've seen. Now, we have another interesting question on our slide, okay? The question says, what if I want a ceiling for the burst? So we had two scenarios. Now we set the maximum limit. So we've seen with UDP it right started peaking off, okay? And then it went back to 10. And then after that, we tried with TCP. Again, it hit as very fast speed, as quickly as possible, okay? And then once it consumed my 100 megabits, okay, 10 times 10, because I'm using 10 as a, as a max limit, um, uh, once it consumes that, it went back, back to the max limit of 10. What if I don't want my traffic to exceed a certain amount of throughput, okay? What we can do, we can, we can leverage the, 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 the hierarchical structure by using a parent to child relationship. If I use a parent to child relationship, then this, the spike we were seeing there, hitting 40, 50 megabits, we can reduce it to a speed which we want. And we don't allow that, but we still have the functionality to burst, and we still need to allow 100 megabits of data to go through the queue before the tokens have been depleted. Okay. So, so what what uh, what will be the theoretic the theoretical ceiling speed of the burst at this moment? Within that 100 mega, within, within that 100 megabit of traffic, what will be the theoretical maximum ceiling speed that the burst will reach? Could reach? No, 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 no. Wait, the bucket size control how many packets you can queue. The interface speed, exactly. So the maximum speed will be the interface speed. Now, we, what we would like is to set roof, to say, don't go over that amount. Okay, so how would we do it? I mean, this obviously we have a small lab here with smaller equipment, so we're using 10 not to kill the bandwidth test. But let's say we had a max limit of 50. We have, we have a max limit of 50. 50 multiplied by a large bucket size of 10 gives us 500 megabits. So we are allowed by the bucket size by our algorithm to let 500 megabits of data to go through at the fastest speed possible. Okay? So because um, our queue, if we had to use a, a, a bandwidth test through our devices, we'd expect to have hit the interface speed of 100, and we'd expect to see the interface hit for a total of five seconds. Why? Because we're passing 100 megabits per second on the interface, which is our maximum physically, but the, the available, available tokens allow us to pass 10 
times 50, the maximum size of the packet, times the, the, the maximum rate we have. So 500 megabits of traffic will be allowed to pass at the interface speed. After that, we'll go down to 50, which is our max limit. Okay, so that is what we would expect to see. Now, to simulate this on a lesser throughput, we're going to physically sit our ceiling ourselves, as if we have a 20 megabit interface, for example, and not a 100 megabit interface as a parent, okay? So how do we do this? Okay, so from our side, we have created this structure over here, which is the parent-child structure, okay? Where the parent, okay, just has the standard max limit, and the max limit is set to 20. We didn't change anything else in just creating this queue. It's a 20 megabit hard limit with a bucket size of 0.1. So the only thing I expect to see if I just run traffic through the parent, if only the parent existed, so it would be a leaf, it would be a child, it would be 20 megabits, and uh, the 10% the we spoke about before, so up to 22 megabits for a split of a second, and then hits down to, to 20. Okay? But in our structure, what we've done, we've put the parent at 20 megabits with the default bucket size, okay? and the child, okay, which is at 10 megabits, but with a bucket size of 10, meaning that we should be allowed to pass 100 megabits of data at the maximum speed possible. But our maximum speed possible now is 20. Okay? So what we expect to see here is we expect to see um, depending on UDP or TCP, what, what we're using, TCP will slightly take a bit longer to settle because, um, uh, because, because of, of the TCP structure. UDP will start gradually to hit the 20, but we expect to see a 20 megabit throughput for an average of five seconds because we need to consume 100 megabits of data, so that will take five seconds at a rate of 20 megabits, and once we've consumed that, we're going to go down back to our maximum limit. Okay, so to simulate this, we have the child and the parent. We're going to have a look at the... And why, why the maximum limit is, is 20? Why the maximum limit of, 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 the, of the child queue is going to be 20? Hmm? For, for the burst, for the burst time, for the, for the amount of time that is allowed to burst. Yeah, they said. No, because that will be the maximum rate at which it can actually borrow from the parent. So the parent will not lend more than 20. So the bucket can be as large as you want, but it will replenish at 20. Yeah, in fact, we could get a different scenario, a bit of a, a stranger scenario, if we put it this way, if we put a larger bucket on the parent. Because then, for some time, we'll also be allowed to burst a bit more on the parent because there are still tokens available on the parent as well. But with such a small bucket size on the parent, there isn't a lot allowance to go over the 20 megabits, basically. Okay, so by starting the test over here, no, we didn't. 20, 20, and down. So over there, we couldn't exceed 20, because 20, like we're saying, is the hard limit with no available It's maxing uh, out the CPU already. And yeah, mm -hmm. we have a, it's, it's a CPU is maxing out over there. But uh, what we've seen, we've seen an explanation of what we, we, we're explaining here, that we're getting the 100 megabits we calculated from our algorithm. Again, it's simple. The algorithm is simple. It's just taking the bucket size, multiply it our, by our max limit. Okay. With such a small bucket size, the default, we don't have a, a big effect. There's just the 10% we see in the spike in the beginning. With a bigger bucket size, we can see the effect. 10 times 10, we're allowed to pass up to 100 megabits of data. Okay? With a limit on the parent of 20, we can only allow to pass 20 megabits for approximately five seconds. Okay? Once we've hit the five seconds, then we have to go down back to our maximum. Why? Because as a child, we don't have any more tokens available uh, at a faster rate because the bucket has been emptied out and it's only replenishing at the speed of our maximum rate. Any questions so far? Yes. So, so the bucket sites will work like burst 
without a burst limit. To be able to force a ceiling, we can set the maxi limit on the parent queue. That's exactly what we have been done. A small bucket with 20, mega, uh, 20 megabit to max limit on the parent with a child having a large bucket with 10 on max limit. That's exactly what we did. This is the, was the result we were getting at home. Okay. So the large bucket at the child with the 10 megabit max limit will still allow 100 meg of traffic to go through, but the parent is replenishing the bucket at 20 megabit rate. So it will take more or less five seconds to be able to empty the 100 meg bucket before the queue settles at the actual token rate of 10 megabit. Okay, very, in very interesting and predictable. <clears throat> so, why and what you can do with this function? So, let's try to find a regular application. So, the very predictable traffic can be handled by small buckets. Larger buckets might be required for burster traffic. So, if you have interaction, you want to enlarge your bucket. Okay? Unless one of the desired goals is to reduce the burstiness of the flows themselves. Okay, so if we actually use small bucket, you can go as small as one hundredth of the max limit. That will be almost just replenishing the bucket at the token rate. No, there will be almost no bucket. You can go to zero. Yeah, you can go to zero. Ah, okay, you can go to zero. Yeah, okay. So basically, there is no bucket, just the token rate. And uh, that will kind of regulate if there is a bur if there are bursts, it will try to to smooth the, bu the bursts in the traffic itself. Okay. So these are the credits, the reference, the wiki, <coughs> something <coughs> on LinuxIP.net, and that's it for us. <coughs> Thank you. Any questions?